Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Salt Grain Podcast, episode one. I'm your host, Holly McNamara. I'm here with my dog, Charlie, (laughs) and I'm super excited to get this started. I've been wanting to do this for a really long time. We um, put together the the trailer, um, and I just wanted to kind of touch upon, well, actually deep dive into why I decided to do this podcast and also going back into my life story and who I am and kind of where this comes from and what it encompasses. So my my it goes all the way back to my childhood. Um, I was brought up with, you know, I had really good, really good childhood. I was brought up with a father who instilled a lot of values in me, science, um, especially science and math, and my mom as well. And, um, you know, they always, they were teachers. So uh, they really encouraged learning, reading, and I was, I grew up really wanting to learn more um, and interested in how things work and solving problems. Um, And I grew up in my hometown, Somerset, Massachusetts. It's a town of about 18,000. It's about an hour south of Boston. It's actually closer to Providence, Rhode Island, about 20 minutes from Providence. And we, you know, my whole life, um, we live, the, the town borders approximately seven miles worth, which is the entire length of the town, borders uh, the Taunton River and Mount Hope Bay. And, you know, growing up, we never really realized what we had. Um, and I'll never forget when one of my boyfriends came home to visit for the first time. He was from Los Angeles um, and he came home and saw that we lived on water and he freaked out. <laughs> He's like, you know, you, you live on the water? <laughs> and, um, and I said, it's just the Taunton River. Like, you know, it's just, it's kind of dirty and we don't really swim in it. We have a beach called Pierce Beach, but we didn't really go there very much. And he, I said, well, you live in Los Angeles. Like the beaches there are beautiful and you live at the base of a mountain. And he still couldn't get over the fact that we live on the water. I mean, you could see it from my mom's house, which was halfway up the street. So that really stuck with me for my entire life. Um, and I'll kind of get into that later because that was something that really stuck with me, especially um, when I decided to run for office, which is something I never expected to do. Um, you know, I went through my life. I went to engineering school. I went to Cornell and then decided to move to Southern California to go to UC San Diego for my master's. Um, Loved it out there. It was just a great opportunity to see the rest of the country. I ended up staying in San Diego for 11 years. And um, for the last, you know, actually for a few of the, about three years, three and a half years in the middle of those 11 years, I would fly to Las Vegas for my engineering job. And I'll have a whole episode about that, but that was an insane experience. I met all sorts of people in the nightlife industry. Um, This was before social media, so I'm really dating myself, but um, met a lot of people in the nightlife industry and started to, as a hobby, like help my friends and then their friends um, get into the, you know, different clubs and tell them you know, how to get in and what to say to get in. So that that was something I developed as a, as a hobby, but there were so many crazy stories from that, that experience, and I'm going to have an episode on that eventually. And so in the meantime, I actually met the CEO of Zappos at the time, um, who recently in 2020 has passed away. Um, very unfortunate circumstances. Um, but he was my friend first and foremost. I met him in 2004 um, because I was traveling to Las Vegas. A mutual friend of ours connected us. Um, they played poker together and they, he said, oh, you guys, you know, he just moved his company Zappos to Las Vegas. You guys should connect and hang out. So we became good friends. And um, about seven years later, I ended up helping him launch his book, which became a best-selling book for 27 weeks. Um, but that is another episode that I will be talking about. And to get to the bottom line, though, before I go on, um, because this will all, once I tell this life kind of life story, um, 
it'll all make sense as to why I'm here and why I wanted to do this podcast. Um, so anyway, so meeting Tony was a huge, Tony Shea was a huge, um, had a huge impact on my life. It still does, even after his passing. Um, eventually, I ended up moving to Las Vegas and helping him launch his book. I lived there for almost two years, and that was an incredible crazy, crazy life-changing experience. Um, I, you know, there's a recent book that came out that talks about my experience and it's a book called, uh, the title is Wonder Boy. It's about Tony Shea, um, and his passing and the, the highs and lows of his life, um, going all the way back to his childhood. And there's a chapter in there. And I, I spoke with Forbes for lengthy time, um, putting everything out there. And, you know, that was a lot of the, the positive things happened, but there were a lot of negative things that did happen that you really wouldn't have known. The public wouldn't have known, but they're in the book. Um, and one of the people on the tour, I caught stealing a lot of money. Um, and ultimately she stole millions of dollars and I believe enabled Tony's death. Um, and that is another story for another another time. But anyway, moving on, I left after two years, left Las Vegas and moved to San Francisco, worked for a startup for a bit um, and decided after 14 years living away that I missed home. Um, I wanted to move home and be with my family and I missed my mom and my sister. My dad had passed away when I was 19 and... Uh, of cancer, and he was also a huge influence on my life and still is. And so I just really missed my family, um, wanted to move back to the town that raised me on the Taunton River. <laughs> um, having lived in San Diego for so long, I really appreciated what we have here in Somerset. We, you know, we do have the waterfront. I really learned that um, we really took for granted all of the kind of amenities that the town naturally has. And we take for granted, you know, that we're close to these major cities and we just take a, a lot of things for granted. We take for granted the good schools that we have um, that weren't so good in California. And, you know, my whole take was that Somerset has what it takes to be so much better. We're just not utilizing our resources. So anyway, in the meantime... Um, I ended up <laughs> becoming really good friends with, uh, my friend Ryan, who ended, he was running the Groove Cruise, um, which is now the world's largest floating music festival. And so that kind of weaves into my life in various ways. Um, that will be another podcast episode. And, um, so anyway, I moved home in 2013 I moved in with my mom. I lived with her for about a year and I was just so exhausted. Um, I moved home and ultimately, well, pretty quickly got a job right after the Boston bombings. That was when I moved home, um, right, actually right before the Boston bombings. And then the job started just after the Boston bombings. And I ended up working for one of the first responders, Boston Medical Center, as a project manager in their construction group. And uh, I was just so honored to work there. And I worked there for a couple of years. Um, ultimately, they couldn't pay the salary that I wanted, so I ended up leaving. Um, but I still stay in touch with them. And it was just so great to be there. And they were so, everyone was just so down to earth. And it was just like a nice reminder to be back in the Northeast. Um, it's just a very different place compared to California, I'm sure you can imagine. And so, you know, I'll, I'll never forget um, I was walking out of the power plant in the hospital, which is where our offices were. And I was walking across the street to go to the hospital, working on a project that I was doing. And my HVAC guy, Paul, was walking in. So we passed each other. And this was right when I started my job. So I was still adjusting. It was a culture shock coming back. Um, and when, so when Paul was passing me, I said, Hey, how are you, how are you doing, Paul? And he said, I'm fucking awful. How are you? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, I'm home. This feels great. 
<laughs> so it was just so nice to be back home and with people that are real and they don't have a filter and they're no bullshit. And uh, that was just like a nice reminder that I had been away for so long and it's really good to be back. Um, and ultimately, I, my sister and I decided to get involved in, we heard that there was going to be an event in our old high school, which was built in 1936. And uh, I said, you know what, Mom, I really want to get more involved in town. Um, I really love this town. It's like, you know, it's just such a, such a sentimental thing for me. It raised me. I lived here my whole life, you know, with the exception of California, but just good, great memories. And a lot of people were still here. And she said, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. They're um, organizing an event in the old high school building. They were demoing the building before they finished building the new school behind it. And we ended up going to these meetings, my sister and I, and at the first meeting, there were about 40 of us in the room and the woman running the meeting. Um, and I, I'm not going to use names here. I don't really want to use names if I can avoid that. So I'm. <laughs> if you're wondering why I'm not using names, that's why. Um, so the woman running the meeting, she went around the room and said, okay, we, we're going to need to assign roles. So she started assigning roles. And towards the end, she said, okay, we need someone to build the website. And at the time, I was working for Boston Medical Center. So, I, you know, I'm busy. I'm driving from Boston. And sometimes it's two hours with traffic. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to have time to do this. So my sister nudged me and got me to commit to doing the website. So I said, sure, no problem. So I committed to the website. And then she kept assigning more roles. And then ultimately, at the end, she said, well, you know, she said, I had so much to do with the construction of the new school, and it was very political, if you can believe that. Um, and she said, so I need someone that's neutral politically to take this over and run the whole event. And my sister started nudging me. I'm like, oh, God, no, no, I'm not, <laughs> not doing this. And she nudged me again, and, and no one's raising their hand. And me being a type A, I said, oh, God, I'm going to do it. So... <laughs> So I raised my hand. Um, you know, the funny thing is, too, I wasn't even supposed to be at that meeting because I was coming home late in traffic. But I went. And honestly, it was the best decision I ever made. It changed my life. Um, the event was incredible. We it was it would almost felt like, you know, when we said goodbye to the school, it felt like some someone had died. It felt like we went to a wake. You know, all those memories went with the building and we and we so the name of it was Raiders Remember. Um, we had a full day event, two different events, one daytime, one nighttime. Uh, the daytime was like a passing through. The nighttime was a, an event with food and music, like five bars, five food stations, memorabilia. Um, there was a little um, like a, a store we had set up. We were selling different things. Um, lots of, you know, tables and places for people to sit and eat and listen to music. And 2,000 people, we estimate, showed up for the evening event. And two, about 2,000 came during the day as well. So people were coming in from all over. And you can imagine, I mean, my town, everyone is super nostalgic and um, sentimental in a way. And I think the older we get, the more we do appreciate where we come from because some of us, you know, see the rest of the world and realize that it's just such a unique place to live. Um, and I have always cherished it. And the, the older I get, the more I do cherish where I grew up. Um, and I'm still here now in Somerset. And so um, ultimately, in, in Raiders Remember, that's where I ended up meeting my boyfriend. And, and that's a whole other story that I could tell for an entire episode. But we met and um, he was also very sentimental about the town and, um, you know, finally getting out after his separation. And so everything was falling together. Um, we ended up started starting to date. Um, I ended up leaving BMC and working for another company and then ultimately being self-employed for seven years. Um, in the midst of it all, when I started this, right, it was before I was self-employed, um, I started asking questions. Um, 
I ended up buying a house in my town, half a mile from my mom, um, on the water, beautiful view of the water, and beautiful house. Never in a million years would I have thought that I could own something like this. And I bought the house and started, you know, I really wanted to settle there and live there forever. And I had just been traveling and moving so much that I knew that, you know, like, I think I'm ready and I have a boyfriend for the first time in a decade. And, um, you know, there's just, I'm, I'm ready to settle down. And so I bought the house. Um, my boyfriend and his kids moved in and we loved it. Um, and at the first six months or so, I thought to myself, wait a minute, the town hasn't changed. I mean, the signs even, are, they're 20 years old, 30, 40 years old. Um, nothing has changed. Maybe a couple of buildings had been repurposed, but things were still, they were getting rusty and the storefronts looked old. Um, the school was brand new, the high school, but even the elementary schools were old. Uh, the middle school is still the middle school. And it just, nothing really changed. And I started to get concerned and I thought, you know, why has nothing changed? I don't really understand. So I, again, wanted to get even more involved and started asking people questions. And someone I had met said, you know, you should really join the Economic Development Committee. It's a team of volunteers in town. I had no idea what they did except for economic development, obviously. And um, I went to one of their meetings for the first time one of the people on the committee was one of my mom's neighbors. Like I know some of the people on the committee, so I felt comfortable. And they were talking about a half a million dollar grant that they were going to apply for. And they it was called Reinventing Main Street. And I believe the application was going to um, Mark Cuban and it was like a shark tank thing. And I said, oh, I just came from that world. I worked for the CEO of Zappos. You know, there were people like Ivanka Trump um, and people like Mark Cuban and, you know, Ashton Kutcher and all of these investors and celebrities, for the most part, um, that we were surrounded by when I worked for Tony Shea. And I um, was happy to help them with the grant, but they didn't, they um, decided to iterate on the grant for just a couple of weeks and then submit what they came with over the couple of weeks. And I, I thought to myself, there was no way anyone could write a half a million dollar grant, especially people that are just volunteering their time that really don't have the expertise. A half a million dollar grant in two weeks via email, it just didn't sit well with me. And I thought, I just bought a house here. What's going on? Um, so I started asking more questions and um, I can mention this name, Jameson Souza, very good friend of mine. He, he was the agent, my agent for purchasing my house. Um, he was a class president and I planned all the reunions with him. Um, he was also a very good friend. He still is. So I called him once on my drive to Boston and I said, Jameson, what is going on with the town? Like nothing has changed. Is that normal? Like I, you know, I haven't been around in a long time. I visited a lot, but never really noticed. And he started explaining that in 2006, there was a master plan that spent $90,000 on this master plan and it was shelved. And one of the reasons it was shelved was because Politically, no one could get along. Um, no one could agree on anything, which is quite embarrassing. But um, now I understand it. Back then, I just couldn't wrap my head around it, especially being coming from an engineering and construction background. Like you solve problems and you get stuff done and you do it quickly. And I just couldn't. It really bothered me that this $90,000 plan that was preparing for the closure of our power plants was sitting there shelved. So he explained that we also had a part-time planner 
And she left ultimately because of politics um, and never came back. And when you have a master plan and you want it to be implemented, you need a town planner. Um, most people know this, but apparently people in my town do not. <laughs> um, and I'll get to that later. But um, so ultimately, um, I I said, well, I have to do something. I mean, I can't sit here and live in this home that I just bought and wanting to retire here and watch my town fizzle away um, and kind of rot away. Um, you know, we have people volunteering for to write fifty five hundred thousand dollars grants that we're not going to get because we didn't end up getting it because so we don't have the expertise, um, and we just don't have the right pieces in place. And Jameson said, "Well, you're going to need to run for office. That's really the only way you can make a difference." I said, "No way." <laughs> I am not a politician. And he said, no, 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 you're going to have to run for office. It's, you know, if selectmen would be a great move for you. I said, Jameson, there is no way that I am going to run for office. And, you know, he, we talked about it a bit and I got off the phone and I thought to myself, I, I just don't know. I mean, I mean, but I started to convince myself like, okay, I could see it as like a construction project. We're managing the town, being a selectman is, it's to, to clarify, a selectman, um, it is a New England form of government. There's a board of selectmen in towns under a certain size. I believe that size is about 50,000, I'm not sure. Um, but we are a town, not a city. And towns have an open form of government with open town meeting. And which is the purest form of democracy where every single vote is the same um, and is not representative town meeting. Some towns do have representative town meeting, but we have the oldest form. Our town was formed in 1790, 1790. Um, and we, we have a board of selectmen of three and the three vote together as a mayor would by themselves. So the three, the board governs the town as a mayor would in a city. So Jameson said, you got to run for selectman. And I thought, oh, I guess I could see it as a construction project. You know, I'm managing money, I'm managing people, I'm dealing with difficult people. And I thought, I probably can, I think I can do this. And then I started asking more people that I knew, um, adults and, you know, pe folks I knew that were friends with my parents and other, you know, teachers and whatnot. And all of them said, yes, I would vote for you. And I'm like, what? Are you crazy? <laughs> Why? Why me? So anyway, I ended up running. There was a seven, there were seven people running for one seat. And some folks were like, oh, you know, maybe you should wait a year. There's an election every year for one seat and they rotate. And so it's a three-year term. And I said, why do I have to wait? You know, why can't someone else wait? So what I ended up doing was I pulled papers. I decided to do it. I pulled papers and I got all my, all the required signatures in 12 hours and which is not normal. <laughs> and typically people take a couple months casually and then they turn it in. I did it in 12 hours, turned it in, made the headlines, and then four of the seven dropped out. So it ended up being me, the incumbent, and another opponent. Um, the third opponent was planted there, um, and we're pretty sure of this. The third opponent was planted there to remove the current police chief. Um, there was a big vendetta against the current police chief, who his name is Chief McNeil. And he, I didn't know anything about him at the time. I knew he was a good guy, but that's it. And I knew that these people in town, really not good people, were interested in putting their friend in his place. And they were angry that he got the job and their friend didn't. So they were putting their friend in to run for selectman so that they could unappoint him and not renew his contract and then put their friend in his place. Well, in the end, um, you know, I ran a crazy election 
And it was the craziest time of my life. One of the craziest. I, I mean, it was so much fun and it was so fulfilling and I met so many people and it was exhausting and I got sick, um, but I loved every minute of it. And I got kind of reacquainted with my community and, you know, I already had a deep love for my community, but it grew. And so I um, ended up winning the election. So the chief's contract was saved. Um, I won 54% of the vote and the second place was the incumbent and the third place was the, the other opponent who was trying to get out the chief and not to toot my own horn, but if you totaled those two opponents, the incumbent and the other opponent votes, I still would have won um, by a lot, a significant amount. So I got 54% of the vote and there was a fourth um, person that ended up running, but he only got 100 votes. He didn't campaign. He didn't do anything. So he's a good, great guy, but he just came in so he could have a platform. Um, but either way, I ended up winning. And honestly, it was one of the most euphoric feelings in my entire life. It was one of the biggest adrenaline rushes I have ever felt. You know, I've played sports. I've I've been I've been involved in music. I've done a lot of different things. And this was like nothing else I've ever experienced before. Um, I cried. My mom cried. It was just, here I am. I love my town. In 2016, I won that election and I loved my town. Um, so much has happened since. And... I realized over time, you know, because for so long, here I am, an engineer, a left brain thinker that just wants facts and wants things to make sense and wants to solve problems and help people. I've always loved people. But what I learned over time is that you can't please everyone. Um, you have to take life with a grain of salt hence my title of the podcast, um, take life with a grain of salt and you can't take yourself too seriously. You just can't. You know, I never wanted to be a politician. Um, I became a politician and I still don't think of myself as a typical politician. Um, clearly, I became a politician, but I don't, like I try to be as self-aware as possible so that I don't forget where I came from and I don't pander to people just for votes. I didn't run for office to be voted in to be a politician. I ran for office to help my town and to make it a better place to live because I want it to stay and I want it to be the best that it can be. And, you know, I, I really... Along those same lines, um, a lot of people, they say, oh, we, we want politicians that are honest and we want politicians that are real. Well, they only mean that when it's something they want to hear. Um, and unfortunately, you can't tell everyone something they want to hear all the time because that's not the right thing to do. And again, back to you can't please everyone, people get upset and... You know, I also had to realize that the hard way is that people don't, they just want you to pander to them. And if you don't, they get angry and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to vote for you. So my response to that was fine. Don't vote for me because I feel that I'm doing what's right. If you don't like that, then don't vote for me. And I'm fine with that. Um, I like to be able to sleep at night and feel good about my decision. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of politicians, I just th feel like it's getting worse uh, locally, statewide, nationally. There's so much pandering and grandstanding because, you know, with social media now, it's worse and worse and worse. And so I think most of the bad politicians are doing it just for votes and to stay in power. 
Um, and you can you can tell. And, you know, I, I have differing opinions with some friends, but we can get to that later. Um, you know, my town, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some highlights here just to summarize um, what I plan to talk about on this podcast. Um, I'm going to talk about back to Tony Shea and the CEO of Zappos. I That applies to politics all the time. What I learned from that a decade, more than a decade ago, and watching that woman steal millions of dollars for herself and no one do anything about it, that applies in politics. I didn't speak up back then. I, I spoke up quietly, but I didn't know what else to do. And now I speak up loudly because now my friend is dead and that woman stole millions of dollars and I believe enabled what eventually led to his death. Um, I regret not being louder. And so as a politician, I speak up all the time. If I see something, I say something. And it has nothing to do with me wanting votes or getting elected. After two terms, I was in office for two terms, five years, one year short of my second term, I resigned because of the, the lack of ethics on my board and the potential illegal activity that was going on that is still not necessarily happening now, but still being investigated. And I know this for a fact. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Tony Shea and how that's influenced my life. And I'm going to talk about his death and how that's affected me as well. And kind of hindsight is 2020. Um, politically, when I you know first started out in office, I was very naive. I thought people were nice. And um, there are a lot of people that aren't so nice. <laughs> um, I ended up going on a trip to San Diego with my boyfriend. I was in my one of my best friend's wedding. I was the maid of honor for the first time in my life. And the trip got cut short because my police chief, I'm sorry, not the police chief, one of the sergeants decided to call DCF on me. Not my boyfriend. I've never had kids. He called DCF on me. I don't have kids. Um, and that blew up. We had to change our flights. We spent money. Um, and all of it revolved around them going against their police chief, which ties to my original election. That will be an entire episode. I'm going to talk about neighbors not knocking on my door at 10 a.m. on Saturday to yell at me. Um, the rumors, the endless rumors that are still circulating about me having affairs and threesomes and all sorts of stuff. Um, oh, with one of them is about me having an affair with the police chief, which is a complete lie, <laughs> but it's funny. Um, President Biden came to Somerset. President Biden visited Somerset. It was all over the news. I was on Fox News about it, national Fox News. And um, it was an absolutely incredible honor to have any president come to our small town in Somerset. We are finally being put on the map. We lost two of our major power plants, two of our only power plants. One of them was New England Power back in the day. Um, it's called Brayton Point, and it's 300 acres um, that was became a power plant, used to be farmland, became a power plant in the 50s, and is now looking, you know, they, they demoed the old plant, and it was sold to a company named CDC out of St. Louis. And they're now redeveloping the land, a uh, company from Italy is supposed to come in called Prismian, and they're supposed to be coming in and um, and producing the cables for offshore wind. Um, there's a dock. There's a deep water port there. Um, they they're also um, working with the South Coast Wind, which used to be Mayflower Wind, um, to do 
to build an AC-DC converter to plug into the original grid for offshore wind projects. There's just a lot going on. Um, but the neighbors, there are about 50 of them, are so loud and are so against everything, even though, I mean, it could be perfect and they still don't want it. That will be another episode. Um, tonight, there was a very unfortunate vote by our zoning board. And um, I think one of the companies will walk. It's just a total embarrassment. Um, but that will be an, something else that I will talk about. Um, but President Biden came here for that, and my town screwed it up. <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> we need the revenue, and if this company walks, we will lose millions, millions of dollars. So we're waiting to see what happens. But it, it's been, it's part of why I resigned. It's been a nightmare for about four to five years. Um, it's just been, an, a Brayton Point has been a nightmare and it's not because of the company, it's because of the neighbors, the handful of neighbors. It's not even, not even the entire neighborhood, it's just a handful of neighbors that have nothing better to do than intimidate the boards to vote how they want. Um, and unfortunately, most people aren't like me they're voting and they're pandering and they're grandstanding and it's just so embarrassing and they don't know what they're talking about. They're not qualified. Um, I want to talk about my resignation. I'm going to talk about, you know, muting disruptive people, people getting kicked out of meetings. Um, I ended up selling my home, my dream house, because of the neighbors. They were so political um, I had people throwing stuff on my lawn. I had the neighbors cheering in the street. Only one set of neighbors. The rest of the neighbors were great, but they just stayed quiet and they wanted to stay out of it. But this one set of neighbors was so loud and so obnoxious, I just, I couldn't be near them anymore. Um, they would just torment us. And, you know... We've had some great things happen in the town, but we've also had, you know, a lot of this, um, these negative things that I think have impacted us more than ever. Um, and you see it happening nationally. And I, I really want to talk about these things because I think it goes, it applies to local politics. It applies to national politics. It applies to state politics. It all is tied together. And Tip O'Neill always used to say, all politics is local. It is the truth. You need to start at the root to solve the problems. You know, when Mark Zuckerberg was trying to solve all of these problems with Facebook, he was doing it from his ivory tower. They don't understand the open meeting law. They don't understand how, especially local politics works. Okay, they started with national level, but they have to come down to the root to fix it. Um, we have neighboring, our neighboring city is Fall River. Um, their mayor, I'm going to tell you, he, Jaisal Correa, he went to prison. Um, his whole story around that, his campaign manager became his chief of staff. Um, I ended up writing a negative character reference letter about her that probably puts me, uh, my life in jeopardy, but um, I'm going to be talking about that on my podcast. Um, in my experience with her, she actually ran the campaign of one of the opponent of me that in 2016, the one opponent, not the incumbent, the other opponent that was um, put in there to eliminate the chief's contract. And so I'm going to be talking about that on the podcast. Even my my poor mother was bullied by one of the town bullies in the local um, the local Rite Aid, and he was screaming at her. It was Easter morning. She went in for a couple things. He kept saying this nonsense that I was using my father's last name, like that is my last name, <laughs> using my father's last name to win my election. He was screaming it in her face, and my dad had been at that point had been dead for 19 years 
and my mom screamed back at him and poor thing was really upset and but she was so happy that she stood up to him and it was just nasty and so I really want to talk about all these things because I think they're really important um I think politics is changing and the landscape of politics is completely changing and I think we all need to readjust I think that we need to keep it real um Everyone says they want real politicians. They want people that are honest. Well, I was honest and people hated me for it. And I I don't feel bad about it. <laughs> so I just, I'm going to interview people. Um, I want them to tell their stories. And I want you all to be a part of it. I'm going to have people calling in, um, writing in, sending in questions, and interacting on social media. And I really hope that you all will join me on the salt cream. So thank you so much for listening and get ready for the next episode. The Salt Green is a podcast where politicians stop pandering and start getting real. This podcast is me, Holly McNamara, various co-hosts and guests. Our post-production is done by Pixella Films. For more content and all social media links, you can find us on thesaltgrain.com. Thank you for joining us while we take you into our world of public service, and be sure, as always, to take everything with a grain of salt.